do want to again thank everybody for joining us today. And it's being conducted by an electronic conference in accordance with the declaration of emergency, uh, which was done to help contain the spread of COVID-19. So normally we would invite the public to attend that meeting or this meeting, but it's not possible. Uh, the public may be on. Um, so again, not everyone should have their cameras off and mute their microphones um, so that we can hopefully conduct the business of the meeting. In terms of moving forward in terms of where we're headed today, um, I think we've all begun to digest the recent case side developments and to think about what's going to be happening next. The actual form and what we're going to be doing and how it's going to be done will be more formally presented at the IREC meeting that is coming in June as well as the board meetings. And we will be actively consulting with the public and our government partners uh, as we consider the best way to proceed. Uh, however, today we thought it would be interesting to receive presentations from management that reflect on the waterfront development in Toronto since 2001 and to also show you some other facilities and cultural amenities that are common to great waterfront cities around the world and learn more about the vision for the port lands through its planning framework. So I'm hoping this will be uh, both informative and interesting and help us as we move forward uh, to the next steps on our uh, key side development as well. So as we move forward, the first item of business is the approval uh, of the motion to approve the agenda for the meeting. So I could ask for a mover and a seconder. Roger. I'll move it, Steve. Jack. Jack. Seconded, Joe Cressy. Okay, thank you. Um, so all in favor, great, thank you. Are there any uh, conflicts of interest to be declared? Thank you, seeing none. Uh, there are uh, two items on the um, consent agenda that we need to approve. One of them is the minutes of the open session of March 26th um, and May 8th board meetings. So could I have a motion to approve the March 26th, 2020 board meeting? Is there a mover and seconder? I'll move, Patrick. Okay, thank you. I'll second, Jeannie. Okay. And uh, all in favor? Carried. And then a, move, a motion to approve the May 8th, 2020 board meeting. Again, a mover and a seconder. I'll move that, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Seconded I'll by. Move it, Great. Move. Thank you. Carried. So now we'll go on to. Um, uh, what is essentially going to be uh, the guts of the meeting and ask George to um, lead us through the presentations. Uh, first of all, uh, the first one reflecting on Toronto's waterfront. So George, um, I'll hand the floor over to you at this point. Yeah, thanks Steve. I won't take a lot of time. I'll just, uh, uh, first of all, I just want to acknowledge, I don't know if Adam Reddish from the province of Ontario is on. It's uh, his last meeting with us. They've just done a reorganization and uh, that file is moving to another assistant deputy minister. But uh, on behalf of the staff here, Adam, you've been great to work with and I wish you all the best, but uh, thanks again for uh, all the support you've given us. Um, thanks, I think uh, the thanks, George. Great, go ahead, sorry, Adam. Thanks, George. Uh, it's been a delightful two years. I'm a big, uh, uh, a big user of the waterfront and uh, I've really had a real personal attachment to this file and I'm going to miss it, but I'm going to enjoy watching it as you go forward and continuing to enjoy my time on the waterfront when I get down there. So thank you. That's, that's great. Um, so Steve, I'm not going to take a lot of time. Um, really what this came out of was a bit of preparation, quite frankly, when I joined uh, the waterfront to uh, look at a bit of the history. And I think a lot of questions have come up as to what's really uh, happened along the waterfront since 2001. So what I've had asked Chris to do, and this was part of a presentation we actually did a few months ago to uh, our staff and our senior management team is to look at, you know, what, what has occurred on the waterfront since 2001, both in terms of development and also public realm and space. Um, and then as we get into the other presentations, how do we actually 
compare to the other jurisdictions that are renowned for the waterfronts? What are the attributes and how do we compare? Uh, we'll dig a little bit into Chicago and San Francisco, uh, and then we look at both the framework for the Portlands um, and also the Villiers Island Precinct Plan, um, because there has been some direction set by the city around uh, what the expectations for the waterfront are. Um, but we have to also reflect on the pandemic, and the pandemic really has, uh, you know, asked basically cities to step back and take a look at what do we need for the future uh, post pandemic and a lot of focus will be on you know in the public space um, public realm uh, the bike lanes uh, we already knew that we had a ferry terminal that had a lot of crowding in it and it's one of our priority projects so really this allows us over the next little while prior to our meeting in june to just reflect on uh, what's transpired since 2001 how do we compare and what's the guidelines for going forward and what are our needs given the post-pandemic um, environment? So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris at this point, Steve, to walk us through the first part, which is what's actually um, transpired on the waterfront since the creation of the Waterfront Toronto. Can everyone see the presentation screen? Good on this point. Yep. Yes, thanks. Hey. Now, why is it not advancing? <laughs> okay, that's strange. It was just advancing a moment ago. I don't get it. Um, let's see. All right, now you probably can't see all of it. Let's see. Go back to full screen. Okay, yeah. So, okay, here we go. So, this is. Um, the waterfront area in, uh, in in about 2000, right before Waterfront Toronto was formed. You see the buildings in the dark brown, um, most of which were from the 1970s and 1980s and virtually no other development uh, was happening. Um, and this is what it looks like in the present day. So we've probably more than doubled the amount of square footage that's down here in um, a combination of projects that we led, which are the East Bayfront ones sort of towards the upper right. And then what they call South Core, which is kind of clustered around where the ferry terminal is closer to the CN Tower. And this is just buildings that are completed and occupied. We now look at what's under construction, got several more million square feet. Um, some of the ones there in that ochre color are very close to uh, occupancy. Uh, others are, are, are still into construction. Um, and this again is a uh, combination of ones that were built um, effectively as of right under uh, some zoning that we created over in the East Bay front. So again, the upper right hand corner uh, and then ones that went through a uh, more traditional developer process. So um, the combination of, of our projects and others. And then if you look at current active development applications that are in with the city, you see there's a lot more uh, in the pipeline and the waterfront's really starting to fill out. And then if you look at the zoning, um, which we put in place for the rest of East Bayfront, uh, you see in gray, um, that site includes a uh, quayside um, and a private uh, development site that's also about to get started, uh, owned by uh, Greenland. So there's a huge amount of uh, population coming in here. And if you go back just to that uh, series of sort of yellow ones, the four or five towers there, we just reviewed that at the design review panel today and they're building, um, I'm now forgetting the exact number, but I think uh, 3000 units are going in there. So that's, you know, call that 6,000 people potentially. Um, so that's a small town going up on uh, three, three blocks or two blocks basically um, in, in the heart of the waterfront. Um, so development's definitely happening. It's definitely an established market now for developers. Um, and a lot of parks have happened too. And one of the things we did at Waterfront Toronto was we adopted this notion of building the public parks first. So leading with landscape, as we called it, as a way to create some public faith in the waterfront, create some excitement, and also to help increase real estate values before we took properties out to market. So I'm gonna turn this bit over to uh, Pina um, and she's just going to walk you through what's happened from a parks uh, perspective over the last 20 years. Bina, are you there? Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, like the development sequence that Chris just walked us through, I'm going to quickly walk through a few slides 
that demonstrate the amount of uh, increase in publicly accessible waterfront that's happened in the last 20 years. Um, in 2001, what you see here is a waterfront that had a sparse distribution of parks, largely post-industrial sites with some uh, development that had already begun. Uh, and a largely, I guess uh, I would say, unwelcoming public realm like we saw in Queens Key before we uh, reconstructed it. Next slide. Chris, are you controlling the slides? Give me a sec. This slide shows a timeline of the parks that have been completed along the waterfront since 2001. It actually started with some planning, as Chris had uh, uh, ex um, uh, alluded to. Um, we undertook a central waterfront public space uh, framework plan that was approved by council in 2003. And that really drove uh, the increase in public realm over the coming years. As you can see here, there are 24 new public spaces that have completed, been completed in the central area of the waterfront. Uh, the ones, the blue dots that you see on the map, those were completed by Waterfront Toronto, and the orange dots were completed by the City of Toronto or other third parties. Next slide. This map demonstrates the 24 parks that were on the previous slide uh, geographically. Since inception, Waterfront Toronto has completed 43 hectares of new public spaces, five kilometers of new bike paths, and over 26 kilometers of new trails, paths, promenades across the waterfront. And I'm just gonna quickly walk through a few of these uh, specific projects. If you wanna go to the next slide, Chris. These three slides um, that follow are keyed to this map. They show each of those individual parks uh, with photo and statistics to support it. Um, and uh, I'll just walk through a few examples. In uh, 2008 and 2009, we completed the three new wave decks at the Spadina, Reese, and Simcoe slips. Next slide. We stitched together the Martin Goodman Trail, which has been uh, received quite well by cyclists. Uh, in counts collected during busy summer months, we've seen ridership hit in excess of 600 cyclists per hour on the Martin Goodman Trail. Um, and during this was during busy summer uh, months, but also during the AM PM peak, which means the trail's being used both for commuters, but also for uh, recreational use. Uh, do you want to put to the next slide, Chris? Parks like uh, Corktown Common, which are often listed as the best of Toronto, uh, Parks and Sugar Beach, which is commonly featured uh, in tourist uh, brochures, the one number 14 with the pink umbrella, pink umbrellas. Next slide. The Bentway and Underpass Park, for example, which have changed the way we think about interstitial spaces in, in our cities. And of these 24 uh, projects, Waterfront has received uh, approximately 50 design awards specific to parks and public spaces. We've received uh, over 100 awards in total, but half of those are specific to parks and public spaces. Next slide. Um, this map uh, demonstrates parks that are currently underway or planned for the same geographic area. The dark green uh, demonstrates parks that are currently underway, which means they're either uh, in the design phase or under construction. This includes parks like the ones that are gonna line the future Portland's flood protection project, number 17, 18, and 19, 25, uh, and parks like York and Reese Street Park, number three and four, um, one of which is scheduled to start construction uh, later this year. The light green denotes parks that are planned to be completed, uh, either as part of future parkland dedication, for example, uh, Silo Park, or as future large-scale capital reconstruction projects like Jack Layton Ferry Terminal and Harbor Square Park, number five. Uh, next slide. I'm also going to, I have just a couple slides and talk briefly about transit and what has been completed and what's left to be completed when it comes to transit. So since inception, in partnership with City and TTC, Waterfront Toronto has led the construction of these two portions of new LRT infrastructure, uh, both the reconstruction of the 509-510 line between Bay and Yo-Yo Ma, 
and the first new transit line um, in a while, uh, the 504A line on Cherry Street. Next slide. We've also, I think we've reviewed this uh, previously with the board. Uh, council, this is, represents the council approved Eastern Waterfront Transit Plan, which includes the reconstruction of the Union Station Loop, which is the number one on the map. Uh, a new portal, either at Young Street or at Freeland Street, which is the number two on the map. Uh, a new new track work along Queen's Key, the dark blue, uh, and all the way over to um, Cherry Street, which includes the Joe Cressing is now exiting. And a new track work that goes south into the Portlands, which is the light blue and continues along commissioners to an extension of Broadview uh, north into the Unilever station. And next slide, back to you, Chris. Thanks, Pina. So I'm, I'm just going to wrap up this segment um, with this summary, which shows uh, how much uh, of an impact all of this has had. So to date, um, we've invested about uh, $2 billion, which is estimated um, to have generated about $4.1 billion in economic output to the Canadian economy. If, uh, you, know, if you uh, have faith in those sorts of uh, metrics, so they are commonly used as, as measures. Um, over 1.6 billion in revenues to the three orders of government through direct and indirect uh, and taxes. So which means we've effectively paid back the initial $1.5 billion government seed capital and 2.6 billion in private sector development from our first six developments alone. So not including those other buildings that I showed you, just the ones that we have led, uh, which includes about 6,000 housing units of which 800 are affordable and 1.5 million square feet of commercial development. And the construction of, of all of these projects has generated uh, 18,000 full-time years uh, of employment or full-time year equivalent of employment and um, 5,000 full-time uh, year equivalents of ongoing employment. And total private developments were estimated at about 21 billion uh, in total market value uh, all around the waterfront, uh, which includes all the projects that we were not directly responsible for. Um, and in total is expected to contribute about 25 million new square feet of office, retail and institutional space, and a total of 36,000 new housing units. So basically a small city being built here on the waterfront. And you know, I think what this shows is that um, you know, the waterfront is now a, a viable real estate market and is well on its way to being a viable neighborhood. Um, so I think we've achieved our first our first goal, which was getting this waterfront uh, started. Um, do people have any questions before we move on to the next segment? Steve, do you want to take questions now or at the end? Um, well, we're going into the next part now, right? Uh, oh. Sorry, go ahead. We could. No, I was just going to say, I think, uh, George, we're going into the next presentation now about waterfront cities around the world. Yes. OK, I, I think. Um, I would suggest we go on and then take questions at the end of both. Uh, okay, that's great. Okay, so we're gonna just go right into the next presentation then and Chris will uh, start that now. Okay, so um, you know, one of the things that we asked ourselves not too long ago was now that the, now that the waterfront's kind of viable, what, what's, what's next for the waterfront? How do we really compare to the great waterfronts around the world? And so we, we did an extensive research exercise to uh, try and answer that question. And um, the first thing we did was try to figure out, well, what are the sort of top urban waterfronts in the world? And there's no consensus on it. Uh, these are three of the kind of leading lists of what the best cities are. And the Condé Nast Traveler one is based on a quality of life measure that Condé Nast uses. The Fodor's list is based on sort of tourism popularity. And the Project for Public Spaces list is kind of based on urban design and character. And um, so you, you see some overlaps in these lists. Um, so there's no one answer to what the very top urban waterfronts are, but what's worth noting here is that Toronto is not on any of these lists, um, but uh, Vancouver and Montreal both are. So you know, I'd say we're not quite keeping up with some of our Canadian contemporaries yet, uh, but we're, 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 we're heading there. Um, we then uh, screened out the smaller cities because we wanted to compare ourselves to big cities. Um, so that um, takes out um, many of them. Um, we also got rid of the duplicates. And so this is what the big city uh, waterfronts look like. 
And then we tried to select ones that represented some geographic diversity. So we looked at Europe, Asia, North America, South America, um, and uh, Australia. And this is our list of 10. So whether or not this is the perfect list of the 10 best big waterfronts could be debated, but it's it's certainly representative of, of a very high standard of excellence and recognition. And then we looked at um, uh, the areas of these cities and these maps are still um, a bit of a work in progress, but we tried to draw a boundary line of what is considered the waterfront in those cities just to see how the areas compare. And you can see Toronto in the upper right uh, at about uh, 8.5 square meters, not counting the islands or the Leslie Spit. If you add those in square kilometers, um, we're, 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 we'd be significantly larger. So, you know, we're comparable in size to uh, Chicago, Copenhagen, Singapore, um, maybe a little bit smaller than some of the others. Um, and then what we did was we, we looked at each of them to try to understand what were the things that really made them tick. We call them defining attributes here. But you could think of them kind of as what are those waterfronts known for? And this was the list of 42 characteristics we found that uh, in total these various cities were known for in, in different combinations. And I want to just walk you through those quickly. Um, this is how it adds up. And so you look at, um, you know, cities like Copenhagen and Stockholm, they have a lot of attributes, which kind of means they have a lot of diversity. They have a lot of opportunity for different experiences. They appeal to a lot of people. They fill a lot of functions. Um, and it's not surprising that cities like Copenhagen and Stockholm happen to be ranked like the number one and number two waterfronts in the world, partly because they have so many of these great things. And then as you move along the list, um, you see a, a kind of a range in the totals and you get down to Hong Kong and they've got about 16. Um, and I think a lot of people would probably tell you that Hong Kong is not as great, whoops, not as great a waterfront as, um, sorry, what did I just do here? I have caused a chaos. Um, not as great a waterfront as Copenhagen and, uh, and Stockholm. And then we looked at Toronto and we, you can argue a little bit about whether we got this exactly right, um, but more or less we have about seven things that our waterfront is known for. So the islands, our destination park, everyone knows about those. The beaches, something everybody knows about. Um, our ferries, so I think, are kind of an iconic thing. Harborfront Center, everyone knows about that. Carabana. Um, so, you know, I, I think this kind of reinforces the fact that while we've, you can't see my screen anymore, I'm being told that's not a good thing. What did I do? Can you see it now? No. no? Not yet. No. Nope. Okay. Okay. Do you have it now? Yeah. No? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, thank I'm you. Sorry. So here I am talking about this, and you're not even able to see it. That's okay. So, as I said, you can see that we're we're a little bit low, and you might argue that maybe we have one or two more things on this list than than we've given ourselves credit for, but we don't have 29, and um, I think this is part of why we're not yet up in that upper echelon of, of waterfronts. And so George and I have done a lot of talking about, you know, the need to start to fill this in a little bit and, and, and up, our, up our numbers, up our game. And this could inform our plans going forward. What sorts of things should we be adding to help ourselves um, get into that, that top tier? And so we then, yeah, go ahead, jump in, please. The only thing, I, the point I wanted to make on that previous slide, I don't think one thing is going to make us uh, at the top of that list or within that list. We need to think about a number of things that we need to do to make ourselves uh, uh, waterfront friendly from the perspective of bringing people here all year long and to activate it throughout that period. And there has to be enough. So I don't think one thing is going to be the solution. But as we'll go through the presentation, there's some observations around the cluster of certain things that attract people. Uh, so it's just one of the things I wanted to point out to the board. Yeah, and I think um, to reinforce that point, I'm going to go to the next slide. And so this just showed um, how many of the cities had these attributes. So we wanted to understand which ones seem to be most um, common. And that's not to say that that would be our list, but 
the ones that are more common are probably that much more um, integral to the success of the cities. We're going to want a, a made in Toronto solution. We're not just going to copy what other cities have done. But I think it's interesting to see some commonalities here. So the most interesting one to me is the waterfront promenade. So every one of these cities has a significant water's edge promenade that uh, tends to go for a long distance or a series of uh, long distances where their waterfront is really public. And that's uh, something we haven't quite yet delivered in Toronto. We're starting to build it, but we've got some gaps. Other ones are iconic buildings, bridges, cruise ships, marinas. You see them down here. So water-based activities and then uh, cultural anchors. So what I'm going to do is just very quickly show you examples from each city of these things, and I'll flip through these slides quite fast. So here's um, the iconic buildings. Sorry, got to get that out of the way. Can I make that go away? Can everyone still see? Okay, good. Um, so you see the Sydney Opera House is probably the world's most iconic, iconic building. Um, Marina Bay Sands Hotel. I think a lot of people didn't know about Singapore until this thing got built, and now everybody recognizes this as Singapore. Uh, Hamburg has built a, a new Philharmonic Hall, uh, which is in keeping with its culture as the kind of music capital of Europe. The Nemo Science Center in Amsterdam. Millennium Park uh, by uh, Frank Gehry in Chicago. The National Opera House in Copenhagen by Henning Larsen, who's practically their national architect and the Museum of Contemporary Art by Oscar Niemeyer in Rio de Janeiro. These are all buildings that, you know, you kind of associate them in your mind with those places. Uh, finishing off here with uh, an older one, which is the San Francisco Ferry Building. If I can just jump in. Is uh, your mic I just on? want to reemphasize the earlier point. A lot of those are buildings that you can uh, visit throughout the entire year. So it's not just a summer location. So right now, the only thing that I could think about uh, on our harbor front is, or waterfront would be the harbor front center. Um, so, you know, just a bit of a comparison. Um, so bridges, again, 80% of these cities have spectacular bridges that people know and love. So Chicago, the river is like practically defined by these operable bridges, uh, this whole network of them over the river. Amsterdam, the canal bridges that are everywhere. Um, Stockholm, which is a series of islands uh, really stitched together by bridges. Copenhagen, which has some spectacular bridges. Uh, the Pagan Muhlen Bridge in Hamburg, which is shown in a lot of postcards. The Double Helix Bridge in Singapore, um, which has captured the imaginations of the whole design community. The Sydney Harbor Bridge, which coming from New Jersey, I also think of as the uh, Bayonne Bridge. Exact same bridge designed by the same bridge architect. Side note, and the uh, Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of the iconic buildings. Now, in terms of public realm, we've got the waterfront promenade, and I'll show you all ten of these. So the most famous one is the Copacabana Promenade in Rio de Janeiro. This is about uh, seven kilometers long, unbroken stretch of this very iconic uh, mosaic paving pattern. The Riverwalk in Chicago, which has been implemented in stages, but is now finished and is uh, extremely popular with uh, tourists and Chicagoans. Chicago also has its continuous lakefront trail that connects its beaches and parks. The Landsbrücken Promenade in Hamburg, which is the world's largest floating promenade. It's almost a kilometer long um, and then connects back to other promenade segments in the city. The Barcadero, which was created when they took down the elevated expressway here. Sydney Promenade, which has actually this goes on. You can do um, multi-day walks along the Sydney Harbor Promenade. It goes all throughout the city and the suburbs around it. Marina Bay Promenade in Singapore, which connects up to the Singapore River Promenade. And the Stranwagen Promenade in uh, Stockholm, which is uh, a very old and you can see cobbled um, surface. And the Kavalbad Promenade in Copenhagen, which has recently been uh, expanded with some exuberant architecture. You see the swoopy wooden deck, which is kind of like one of our wave decks, uh, but, you know, several kilometers long. And Amsterdam, again, sort of defined by its canals with promenades all, all along them. And Hong Kong, the Chim Sa Choi promenade, 
um, which is undergoing a, a very extensive renovation now because it is so popular and not really serving uh, the population very well anymore. Um, um, just uh, yeah. on the promenades, um, just for us to think about how important that is, uh, and we'll see, that's one of the most important things the public identified as one of their priorities, but even more so as we start to deal with the, uh, the issue of the post-pandemic period, and clearly uh, the city's looking at where are the places, both parks and promenades and bike lanes, that people can actually um, go to. So it's just something for us to think about. So another interesting one is uh, cruise ship terminals. And you see 90% of the cities are major cruise ship destinations. One of the most famous is uh, Coffin City, uh, which has the annual uh, national, International Cruise Day or Cruise Festival. They get about half a million visitors to the city uh, through the cruise ships. Um, Sydney has two huge terminals and they get over a million uh, passengers coming through the city a year. Um, Stockholm, a big destination on a lot of uh, European cruises. Again, over half a million people a year coming to the city. San Francisco, uh, a little bit smaller, but uh, still a significant uh, presence in the city. Uh, Marina Bay in Singapore um, on a lot of cruise routes. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, a popular cruise destination. Helps when you have a gorgeous beach like uh, um, Ipanema and Copacabana that you get to sail basically right past when the cruise ship comes into the city and the Kai Tech Terminal in Hong Kong, which is uh, close to a million passengers a year. And uh, go ahead, George. So the only other thing, I, uh, what was interesting in conversation with uh, Port Strano is that they pointed out to us that uh, the cruise industry was uh, exploding in Toronto over the last three, four years. In okay. fact, they were doubling each year in terms of number of passengers and, and uh, both passengers and actual cruise boats coming in. Uh, we'll have to see post-pandemic, but it is an area that has been a potential growth area for Toronto. So large downtown marinas are another one. Um, I think one of the biggest is the Burnham Marina in Chicago, which has over a thousand slips and activates the waterfront. And that's one of the benefits of these marinas is, you know, waterfronts tend to be one-sided. If you think of a great retail street, they're usually double-sided. We kind of have one edge that's the land and the other is the water, so we only have half the circle. But this type of boating activity starts to kind of complete the circle and uh, brings activity not just from the upland, but brings activity in from the water side too. Uh, Copenhagen has many slips and canals that are filled with uh, marinas. Uh, San Francisco uh, has several marinas that are uh, at the scale of the South Beach Harbor one, so you know, nearly a thousand slips each. Um, Sydney's Cockle Bay Marina. Stockholm um, doesn't have as many marinas because the entire waterway system is basically filled with docked boats. When you look at photos from the air, it's kind of like uh, one giant marina in Stockholm. Um, Amsterdam as well. Uh, here you see a canal boat, but there's lots of other boats uh, in the city too. And even uh, Rio de Janeiro has the Marina del Gloria, which is, uh, which is also a huge marina. I think it's about 700, though the number's not on the screen. And the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club, which is a very uh, old and storied uh, presence in, 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 in Hong Kong. And uh, Hamburg actually has marinas on its lakes that are connected up to its uh, to the river. Um, another one is ferry systems. So many of these cities rely very heavily on ferries, not just, to, uh, not just for recreation, but also for commuting. So I think the most... Uh, well-known one is the Star Ferry in Hong Kong. I unfortunately don't yet have figures on passenger rates. The Star Ferry moves an inordinate number of people across the bay. Uh, it's got three lines and is uh, uh, boats are constantly jammed with people. And you know some of them are tourists, but a lot of them are just people in Hong Kong using it to get around. Stockholm has a huge ferry system. It's also got an island ferry system just like ours. So Jure Garden is their version of our Toronto Islands. Um, it's about the same size. I think it's about 700 acres and they get millions of visitors there and they run this uh, seasonal ferry uh, out there. Despite the fact that they also have a bridge that connects uh, the Jure Garden back to the mainland. Amsterdam has the uh, GVB ferry, which is a, an automated ferry that only requires one, um, one crew member. So one captain pilots the boat and an automated docking system. And this is a very a significant chunk of their uh, 
commuting system in Amsterdam is uh, is by ferry moving across all their waterways. Bum boats in Singapore are kind of classic. They used to be the main mode of getting around. They're sort of turned into part tourist attraction, but Singaporeans do still use them for getting around. Copenhagen has an all-electric harbor bus system. And Hamburg has ice-breaking ferries because they uh, ferry people on the Elba, and the Elba actually does freeze. Sydney um, has a huge ferry system, as does San Francisco. And in San Francisco, it's predominantly a commuter ferry system. Uh, so that gets us through sort of water-based activities. I'm going to talk a little bit about land-based ones. I'm going to go back uh, to some of those iconic building images because cultural anchors are uh, a major one. And to George's earlier point, most of these cities have multiple cultural anchors. I'm just showing one example from each city. Um, but the scale of what they can attract is pretty amazing and the fact that they're year-round. So the Sydney Opera House uh, they estimate attracts about 8.5 million visitors a year. Now, a lot of them are coming to see the architecture. They don't have 8.5 million tickets for the opera, um, but it is one of the biggest tourist draws in Australia. The Elba Philharmonic draws about 4 million people a year. Some of that is architourism as well. The Shedd Aquarium is one of the biggest aquariums in the U.S., 2 million visitors annually. The Esplanade Theatres in Singapore, which um, uh, was built really because Singapore was kind of thought of as too much of a business city and not cultural enough. So they built this huge theater complex and they now get close to 2 million people a year coming to uh, high quality performances there. The Vasta Musée, that is a ship from the 1600s that sank in the 1600s and was uh, brought back to the surface uh, by the Swedes um, in the 1970s and restored over a period of about 30 years and then put into a museum building this is the largest cultural draw in all of Scandinavia, is this, uh, this uh, maritime museum that features this ship. So one and a half million people a year come to see it. The uh, iFilm Institute in Amsterdam, 750,000. And the Museum of Art in Hong Kong, um, which draws half a million, but is actually undergoing a like half a billion dollar renovation right now to double it in size because uh, like the promenade, it was just overwhelmed by the volume of people. And as you can see, kind of an outmoded, uh, outdated facility. The National Opera House in Copenhagen um, also attracts about a half a million people a year. So, you know, these are major anchors that function year round. So they're drawing people to these waterfronts in all types of weather. Um, and they bring people down for, you know, extended periods of time. And after you go to one of these, what do you want to do after that? You want to go to dinner. So it creates a kind of ready-made market for the kind of better quality dining retail that I think a lot of people wish we had on the Toronto waterfront. Um, another one that's uh, uh, amazingly impactful is arts festivals. So um, Sydney has what they call the Vivid Sydney Festival, which is a light festival that um, is, is exhibited on a lot of the structures around the harbor. Here you see them using the Opera House for an art piece. Estimated that about 2.3 million people attend that. Amsterdam has the Light Festival, which is generally held on the waterfront. Also about a million people come to that. Stockholm has a similar uh, culture festival. Uh, Singapore has the iLight Marina Bay Festival, which is similar to the one in Sydney. So it's all using illumination on the various structures that are on the harbor. Art on the Mart, this is the uh, Merchandise Mart building in Chicago, which has, uh, there's a permanent um, laser show uh, call it a projector, but it's about the size of a house because I think it has a hundred projectors in it that is uh, programmed by different artists. And there's a different art piece, I think every week. And they close down all the major, they close down Wacker Drive, which is the major um, road along the Chicago River. Um, and it's just filled with people who come out to watch the art pieces, including in the rain. The one last time I was in Chicago, it was raining and there were tens of thousands of people standing in the rain watching the art on the March show. Uh, the Illuminate San Francisco Festival um, does things with uh, the bridges in San Francisco. And Copenhagen does a wintertime art festival to help get people out to animate the waterfront. And Hamburg has a big uh, fil annual film festival that takes place on one of the lakes, floating cinemas. So that's, that's the sort of most frequently occurring attributes from those cities and a sense of sort of the scale of, of what they provide and attract. 
And we've also done much uh, more uh, deep research into a couple of the cities, and we intend to do it for the rest of the cities. Um, so I was going to now have Ray just take you through uh, Chicago and San Francisco. So uh, Ray Tosaka on my team has been really um, project managing leading up this whole research. Uh, over to you, Ray. Thanks, Chris. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yes. OK. Um, so we've done further research on two of these top 10 urban waterfronts, Chicago and San Francisco. Uh, we started San Francisco and Chicago because because of the similarities to our waterfront and its shoreline typology, uh, being a harbor overlooking into a vast body of water as well in the fact that these were North American cities. And I think it's our intent to do this additional research for the rest of the top 10 cities that uh, Chris just went through and potentially other urban cities that are up and coming in revitalizing their waterfronts. We looked at these cities through the lens of 12 topics to further understand elements that define the success of these waterfronts. The 12 topics came out of the 42 defining attributes, which Chris went through. Um, today, we'll present three to four key topics for uh, San Francisco and Chicago each that we wanted to highlight. But in the appendices section, you'll see some of the other topics that we uh, have started research on, uh, which are special events, um, sightseeing, eco district tourism, housing and neighborhoods, industrial, indigenous, and riverside development. And I just want to note that the work was pulled together by uh, a larger group of people across the, um, the departments at Waterfront. Next slide. So this is Chicago. Uh, Chicago's successful waterfront is in part a result of a legacy of visionary planning by dedicating land along the lake for parkland and public uses early on during its urban development and citing most of its cultural institutions and architectural icons near the lake and the river. Next slide. Chicago has a strong relationship to the water, both the Lake Michigan waterfront and the Chicago River that meanders through into the downtown core, which creates a more intimate and urban riverside setting and is part of the city's urban fabric. Next. This map shows um, the, the Chicago uh, waterfront looking uh, west. Uh, through the research, we mapped Chicago's waterfront and its key waterfront destinations, including cultural institutions and landmarks. What we found is that Chicago has a high concentration of cultural destinations with approximately 15 cultural institutions within the 10 kilometer stretch of its waterfront and its two kilometer stretch of its river. Next slide. And this is one of the several ways in which Chicago keeps its area along the waterfront busy all year round by clustering major cultural institutions and museums on the waterfront that draws most of the 50 plus million visitors a year. Uh, to the top left, uh, Chicago Museum Campus. This is a lakefront campus housing three of city's leading institutions, Field Museum, Shedd Aquarium, and Adler Planetarium. And these are all within 10 minute walking distance. Each of these places bring many visitors, but collectively they attract over 3.6 million visitors per year. Uh, just to give a comparative, the AGO, the ROM, and the Ontario Science Centre collect collectively attracts just less of that, around 3.2 million a year. And also interesting to note that these museums have programs which host parties and music events after museum hours, which keeps these attractions active well into the evening. Uh, the bottom left image is the Art Institute of Chicago. This is the city's most well-known cultural institution which has more than 300,000 artwork and attracts 1.6 million visitors a year. What makes this institution attractive also is its connection to the waterfront amenities. So just to the east, uh, it connects to the Millennium Park via the 190 meter long Nicholas Bridgeway. The modern wing that was recently constructed in 2009 also has a restaurant on the third floor with views out to the Millennium Park and it's become a popular dining venue overlooking the water. Uh, the two images to the right is the Navy Pier. Chicago has a large recreational pier. It encompasses about 50 acres in land. This is equivalent to the area of East Bayfront, known as the tourist hotspot and entertaining for all ages. It has Ferris wheel, IMAX screen, children's museum, Shakespeare theater, etc. Also with dining options, including beer gardens and the world's largest rooftop bar. It also has public art exhibits and boat tours. Another way in which this recreational pier attracts 9.3 million visitors a year is in the fact that this place offers indoor activities to provide plenty of entertainment throughout the winter season. Next slide. 
lakefront and public spaces, um, the general parkland and cultural attractions between Michigan Avenue and the lakefront, particularly at Millennium Park and Art Institute, include public art pieces such as the Bean, uh, which is called the Cloud Gate, and the Crown Fountain, which also animate the large gardens and the plazas. The continuous lakefront promenades, as well as the more recent revitalization of the Chicago Riverwalk, are also important factors to its success, enabling unpeded access to the city's main attract many attractions on bike, but also on foot, and making it easy and enjoyable for both visitors and locals to spend whole days exploring the waterfront. Next slide. We looked at the Riverside development, Chicago's Riverwalk. This is a 5.5 kilometer Riverside trail that allows for greater access and interaction with the with the river through its hardscape boardwalk, floating wetlands, uh, adjacent patios and restaurants, and also art installations. Many of the Chicago's architectural tours are offered by boat, traveling the length of the river to study the modern skyscrapers and iconic series of steel bridges along its banks. It's worth noting that the riverside is highly urban in contrast from Toronto where the Humber and Don rivers run through the city as part of the natural ravine system. The Chicago River is also used as part of the city's transportation system with many ferry routes running throughout. And public access to the water has been a key component in many of the development proposals along with the creation of the underbridge connections. And for the longest time, the Chicago, Chicago turned its back on the river and now it's considered an asset and focal point for major development in the city. Next slide. We also looked at industrial areas. Chicago's growth into a major urban center is attributed to its strategic location on Chicago River. While not located along the lakefront, the inland riverside areas with pockets of industry are transi transitioning into higher density mixed uses through the Industrial Corridor Modernization Initiative. Um, I just want to give a bit of a historical context on Chicago's industrial uses. Historically, indus industry tended to locate near major rail lines most of which were located inland from the Lake Michigan, in contrast to Toronto's major industrial areas and rail links that have historically located directly on Lake Ontario adjacent to the downtown. The Great Chicago Fire of 1871 destroyed the only central lakefront industrial areas and Chicago created its grand vision of the large park system that would extend Grand Park further into Lake Michigan via landfill. Large industrial areas were then solidified along the inland rail lines, waterways, and eventually the interstate highways. In 2016, the Chicago Depart Department of Planning and Development initiated the Industrial Corridor Mod Modernization Initiative to refine land use policy to encourage continued growth and private investment in the city's industrial corridor system. And this, this is the map you see to the left. The North Branch Industrial Corridor, which is the area uh, in the red, located on the North Branch of Chicago River was one of the first of its modernization initiative with goals to accommodate mixed use business growth in the corridor. And the river district shown in the rendering is a proposed is proposed as a landmark urban tech centric neighborhood to become the become part of the city's tech angle. Next. We also looked at San Francisco. San Francisco is characterized by natural beauty and dramatic type topography on the west coast and reprogrammed industrial piers on the east side. Next. The city is a peninsula with a larger bay, so it is surrounded by waters on three sides and it has lots of marine and land-based activities along the water's edge. And what makes it special is that most of its attraction and landmarks are connected by continuous trails and promenades that provide opportunities for exploring the waterways for entire days. The east side is more urban and active and the west side more natural and picturesque. Next slide. So this is the map again. You can see this is looking actually towards uh, the south from the north side. So the so the west, the east, uh, the, to, towards the left side of, of, of the screen is where um, a lot of the piers uh, are, uh, urban and active. And then to the east, uh, sorry, to the west, uh, right side of the map is where all the natural promenades are. Next slide. These continuous trails and promenades along San Francisco's waterfront are in itself public spaces in that they connect these sightseeing spots along the water. It has seven kilometers of hiking and biking trails from Land's End viewpoint through Golden Gate Bridge and Park to San Francisco Zoo and Lake Merced Park. It has six six kilometers of water's edge promenade and boardwalk from the Maritime Museum through Chrissy Field and under the Golden Gate Bridge. And lastly, 
the Embarcadero Boulevard is a characteristic, characteristic spine that connects all piers from the market and ferry terminal to Fisherman's Wharf along its two kilometers length. Next slide. It's worth noting San Francisco's retail and dining on the waterfront. Uh, while San Francisco doesn't have a waterfront shopping district and might like activities similar to our waterfront, they do have a number of restaurants and markets concentrated in the eastern part of the waterfront. There are many restaurants on Pier 39, most of them overlooking the water and a view to the Golden Gate Bridge all through the, all through the year. The popular restaurants um, we found are closer to the tourist attractions, such as Fisherman's Wharf, and luckily, last weekend's fire just missed the restaurants and shops at this famous tourist and local spot. Apart from the large coffee chains, uh, such as Starbucks, we found that there are many local cafes across the waterfront serving coffee and snacks. There's also a number of market halls on San Francisco waterfront, such as the Ferry Plaza, Iridelli Square, and the Ferry Building also alone is a very innovative tourist attraction. It acts as a ferry terminal, and it has a market hall attracting about 40,000 shoppers every week. We think that the weather in San Francisco is warmer than Toronto and more or, less, more or less consistent throughout the year, and this helps keep San Francisco water busy throughout the year also. Next slide. Marine activation. San Francisco has many and a lot more marine uses activities than Toronto currently does. There's a number of uses from industrial to residential to commercial adjacent to marine activities along the Embarcadero, and many of the commercial maritime activities, primarily boat tours, are supported by adjacent uses such as markets and restaurants. I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the marine activities that engage public along its piers. Uh, some are cruise destinations, uh, recreational boating, uh, particularly there's a lot of sport fishing, uh, numerous harbor tours, including uh, boat tours to the Alcatraz, ferry services uh, to Sausalito, Angel Island, Tibor, Tiburon, sorry, uh, large marinas, uh, as well as the Marina District. There's also a working port um, where they have aggregate uh, international shipping along Pier 80 and Pier 96. And there seems to be a lot of balanced marine activity and uses overall. Next, innovation and academia. Innovation districts and clusters have been an effective tool to revitalize neighborhoods. In future presentations, we'll be discussing Waterfront Toronto's approach to innovation and intelligent communities in more detail. Innovation districts build off an anchor institution to attract related companies and startups, and these districts create significant economic output through jobs and ancillary uses, with some eventually becoming key destination. And Mission Bay in San Francisco is an example of this approach. It's a major economic and urban project on the waterfront in the downtown San Francisco of about 300 acres. 300 acres is equivalent to Bathurst to Young from south of the rail corridor in our context combining urban regeneration of extensive industrial land and development of a biotech cluster around a new campus of the University of California in San Francisco, UCSF. The UCSF medical campus was the first major development in Mission Bay and acted as an anchor institution for what later became, became a biotech innovation hub. The campus also includes a teaching hospital and student housing. And what's interesting is that the existing rail lines that existed were converted into transit, which provides convenient access as the area is served by both San Francisco light rail lines and a Caltrain commuter rail station, which is similar to the Go Rail. Mission Bay is now home to over 50 bioscience startups and over 10 major pharmaceutical companies and grown beyond its biotech roots, attracting Uber's new headquarters and a new waterfront arena that will be home to the Golden State Warriors. And that's the end of the Chicago and San Francisco additional research. Uh, so maybe Chris, I'll just uh, add, um, well, why don't you do the Toronto uh, attributes first and then I'll just comment. There we go. So just to finish off this segment, I just wanted to run through the Toronto attributes in a little more detail. Um, so you saw this comparison already, and um, here's that list of kind of the current attributes. So we have the Toronto Islands, which everybody knows and loves. We have some of our great beaches, like the beaches and, and Sugar Beach, which is uh, known by a lot of people. The Martin Goodman Trail, which as Pina mentioned, has about 600 people 
uh, an hour on a busy day, which, by the way, is more than twice the number of bikes on any other bike facility in the city of Toronto. So it is, by a factor of two, the most popular bike trail uh, in Toronto. Um, recreational boating on the Inner Harbor. We all see it. There's always tons of recreational boating out there. Harborfront Centre is our our waterfront cultural institution that is uh, that has uh, that kind of brand recognition and does attract a lot of folks. Um, but as George said, it is uh, it's one dimension out of many that we could have from a cultural destination point of view on the waterfront. Uh, the Caribbean Festival, which used to be called Carabana, is also a huge event. Um, but it is one huge event per year that comes down the lake shore and traditionally doesn't quite come fully into the downtown uh, waterfront core. And then affordable housing, and not that our waterfront is known as being affordable, but I think Waterfront Toronto uh, is becoming known for building affordable housing. And this is the affordable housing component of the West Donlands, um, which I know uh, Meg Davis worked very hard to secure when we were uh, working back on the Pan Am uh, bid. Um, so I just wanted to mention that we, I showed you that list of seven that we have now. We also have a few more that are coming. So bridges, we're actually building, um, if you haven't seen these designs before, these incredible architectural bridges as part of the Portland's flood protection. We have to build new bridges to go over the new piece of river. Um, we are also going to, in the fullness of time, complete Queens Key East, uh, following the kind of red and white granite palette that we've laid out in the West. And once we've built all that, it'll be three kilometers and I think will become one of the great uh, waterfront boulevards, especially if we get the architecture right on either side. Um, we're also right now out for an open call to build um, the most uh, high value art piece we've yet delivered. This is about uh, just under a $4 million commission um, based on all the development charges that we've collected from the East Bayfront. And we're hoping to do something um, won't be quite on the scale of the bean in Chicago as that was about a $25 million piece, but hopefully something that um, really attracts a lot of attention and creates some, some buzz and excitement um, in, uh, in Sherburne Common or in the water uh, just off the promenade. And from a resilience point of view, our river is one of the great uh, modern engineering for nature stories out there. I mean, there's very few places in the world that are moving their river at half a kilometer. Uh, naturalizing it and surrounding it with a park system. Um, this is going to certainly put Toronto on the map and will certainly change the map of Toronto. For those of you who are, might be map buffs and you look at historic pictures of Toronto, the one thing that changes uh, dramatically over the years is the course of the Don River. And this is going to be the next step in the uh, evolving uh, route of the Don River. So once we add those in, fortunately the slide numbers are competing, but we, 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 we would arguably have sort of 11 attributes that we're well known for. And then I'm just going to finish off with the uh, signature projects. So as we were doing some of this research, we did some public surveys to ask people what they thought they wanted most for Toronto. And the waterfront promenade was at the very top of everybody's list. Um, clean water, which can only be delivered by dealing with our water system citywide, not at the waterfront itself, um, but also resilience, which is very much what the river is going to provide. Waterfront dining is another one that people would really like. So you get you get a sense of some of the things that are priorities all the way down to um, a, a ferry system, a more robust ferry system. Um, so this is just what I showed you before, the attribute frequency. So. Based on that survey and looking at this list, we came up with our list of four signature projects that we wanted to uh, try to deliver um, that we're not currently in our long-term funding plan and that we would start to look for alternative sources of funds for, whether that's philanthropy, corporate sponsorship, um, uh, other types of grants. Um, and, and so those are the idea of adding a cultural landmark institution now this one is shown on what is now Sugar Beach, but this was an idea before we had a Sugar Beach plan, um, but for something iconic on the waterfront that could attract those large numbers of people year round. Um, finally, linking up our bits of waterfront promenade by filling in the blanks and connecting the uh, gaps where the slips are with uh, bridges. Now these bridges were designed as part of a design competition uh, 15 years ago um, really before we were as focused on accessibility. And so uh, we're going to need to revisit these designs to figure out how these can be made accessible to everybody. On the idea of a destination playground, now this is a new 
typology that has come to exist of playgrounds that really aren't playgrounds. They're closer to amusement parks in their scale, uh, but they don't have rides. They just have very uh, elaborate and imaginative pieces of play equipment. This, this playground concept was actually pioneered by Michael Van Valkenburg, who is the landscape architect leading the Portland's flood protection design. So we have the world's expert on destination play um, working on this with us. Um, and as we get to a point where we can start to release some of the design work, I think you'll be pretty amazed at what, uh, what the thinking is shaping up to look like. And then lastly, the Jack Layton Ferry Terminal, which is in a uh, a building that is now too small for the demands uh, that are placed on it. Um, it's another opportunity to build something notable on our waterfront that, that you know, we could be proud of as a city. Uh, that would be a great experience for tourists and, and give them uh, a different perspective on Toronto than the kind of um, bare concrete structure that we have today. So implementing all of those, we've probably got about 15 attributes. So, uh, you know, that would start to really uh, move the needle for us. Um, and as George said, it's not just one thing and it's not just one of each of these, um, but uh, I think this gives us a framework for thinking about what we want to add to our waterfront. So I think I will stop right there and we can take some questions. This is just the map of what's here today. If you remember back to Chicago, one is a lot denser with uh, icons of activities, uh, but this is what we might look like as we uh, move to the future. And this is our kind of longer term vision of a kind of connected waterfront harbor uh, with a series of destinations all around it, um, linked up by boardwalks, promenades, and an improved ferry system. And we've tentatively started calling this the harbor necklace, which fits in very nicely with the city's uh, official plan for creating a series of kind of green rings um, around the city. So um, that's it for that piece of the presentation. And uh, I guess, Steve, over to you if you want to moderate questions. Or George, I'm not yeah, you know what, I'll let uh, Steve moderate. I I'll just say, uh, first of all, thank you to the staff who helped pull this all together. I think we really just wanted the board to reflect on what the possibilities could be as we go forward, uh, looking at what attributes other cities have had that have activated their waterfronts more than we have here in Toronto. Um, and to look at and just to think about, which we can talk about um, in a future meeting, which parcels of land we may want to hold on to uh, because they are in the right places to have a signature piece. Um, so, you know, I'm going to use one example just on Keyside, Block 5 uh, is prime, right? So, is that something we want to consider as we look at do we phase uh, the uh, RFP in the future and, and look at keeping some of the uh, key sites for some signature projects. Um, and it's something for governments, I think, to think about as well. So, Steve, this was really just background for the board, and I'll um, leave it to you uh, if we want to take questions now, and then we'll go into yeah, the frame. Uh, yeah, I think it was a, I think it was a good presentation. For, uh, it's just to give some context to what Toronto's already thought about. So, George, I thought uh, a, a great presentation by everyone to give us some thought. Um, I'm just going to make some comments rather than questions. Steve, uh, then... I think you're on mute. I can't hear. Oh, we I can't am? hear. You, so. No, you're not, Steve. I, I can. I can hear. I you. can hear. Yeah, I can hear Steve as well. I can hear you. Yeah. Me too. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, okay. Steve. I can think you, uh, you can start. Now. Okay. What I was going to say, George, it, it was a great presentation, and I know this is. Uh, just now to get to get our um, minds thinking about where we could go with uh, a respect to a future proposal call. So I'll just raise three issues that I think we all should be thinking about. Um, well, one is just a question the, uh, to ask, um, but there's two things that I think we need to think about in particular. But um, one is in terms of the future, um, whatever we do, we should be thinking carefully about a um, a post pandemic world and where we're headed, uh, whether this is quick or not, but something that we just should keep on our minds in terms of anything we do in the future to make sure we're, we're thinking about that. And secondly, uh, in light of where we're going with the economy, even if we recover from this relatively quickly, when I look at a lot of the other um, cities um, to build a lot of this infrastructure um, or museums uh, and public facilities, 
uh, were you know pretty expensive to build you know the the opera hall in sydney or what we see uh, in chicago and i think we have to think about um where the dollars would potentially come from is it realistic and not realistic and how much would be come from private fundraising and those are in my view um uh, some of the important um, criteria that um, uh, that we have to think about um, as we head to June. But having said yeah. that, are there questions that people have? Um, this is Penelope Gramsciopoulos from the Waterfront Secretariat. Um, I rarely, I think this is my first ever board meeting, despite working on the file for so many years, and it's it's amazing in the midst of this stuff to hear about the next wave and very encouraging. Um, I have a question about uh, the uh, the numbers in terms of uh, attendance and in, in, in your case studies and in the city where you mentioned the three museums get about three million, whether they're local, how they break down in terms of local or foreign if we know. And then in terms of the city, I mean, we don't know what's gonna happen with COVID. So the second question is, but we do see that Toronto is a destination for people to relocate to from all over the world. So when we identify, when you went through that list of identifying the places, the types of things, dining facilities, things like that, uh, which uh, constituents did you get that from? Is it like a combination of international visitors and local people? And to what extent is there any, uh, um, given the population will continue to grow, uh, I know personally dining facilities would be fantastic uh, among the other things like the waterfront promenade, but does it break down in a different way whether you're here or not? And to what extent can these aspirational projects satisfy the thirst that for the millions more people who will be crowding into the city? So Steve, maybe I'll start and I'll turn it over to Chris and Ray. Um, yeah. I think one of the things that uh, we've been challenged with is we got the, the high level data and I'll let Ray and others go to it, but because of the pandemic, uh, it's been hard to access additional information from the cities themselves. So that's something that we would look at. Um, in terms of, and I'll let them speak to who we survey, uh, but I, I can tell you, I've spoken at a number of events, and, and including the Wallace Cl uh, Club and others, and uh, I've had people from uh, international jurisdictions who've moved to, to Toronto, uh, who've actually highlighted how uh, we don't have some of those attributes that we just talked about, and, and, uh, and we don't use the rivers the same way other communities across the world who use their rivers, not just as a natural uh, conservation area, but an economic development area as well. So I think your questions are the right ones because we've asked those questions too. Uh, we're just digging into it. And I think as we get more access to those communities, we'll be able to uh, get to that. The other thing too, is we're gonna be looking at um, Canadian communities like Vancouver and Montreal as well. But Chris and uh, Ray, I don't know if you wanna add to the questions. Um, in terms of um, visitors, uh, for um, I believe it includes both local and tourist. Um, we we looked into um, annual reports of uh, the cultural institutions, um, so we don't have a differentiation um, of whether they are local or whether they're tourists. Um, I believe they don't. Um, some of the institutions don't really track that, but if we are able to find the differentiation, we will do so. Yes. Survey. I think she was just asking who we surveyed or how we did that. Uh, we did um, three pop-ups um, in three locations. One uh, in north of the city, North York, uh, at a park. Uh, we did one at Jack Layton Ferry Terminal, and another one also downtown. And we uh, we actually laid out um, bins um, based on the attributes, the 42 different attributes, and we asked the question around. Um, what is missing on the waterfront, and also what would you like to see on the waterfront? And we actually had people um, put um, uh, candies into the bins, and then we collected uh, numbers of those attributes that uh, scored highest. We also did an online survey. Uh, this was just a, 
a push uh, survey um, done um, and we collected um, um, postal codes. So it was all around Toronto, outside of Toronto, uh, who answered the similar questions around what was missing on the waterfront and what they wanted to see on the waterfront based on those 42 attributes. All right, Steve, we'll Great. give it back Thanks. to you. If there are other yeah, comments any or other, questions. Does anyone have. have any other comments or questions before we move on to the Portlands framework? Steve, it's Jeannie here. Can I share some yep. thoughts and questions? Sorry? It's Jeannie here. Can I share some thoughts and yeah, questions? Yeah, for sure. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, thank you uh, to the team. Uh, obviously, a lot of research and thought put into this. I really appreciate it. And it's nice to see just a, an, in a one page or kind of all the great work that you guys have done over the past uh, decade already, all the economic benefits and everything. Um, but certainly, I mean, we know our city has changed a lot in the 13 years since Waterfront Toronto was first founded. And I think we have a really unique opportunity to think about how we can be part of the solution uh, to a lot of these new challenges that uh, have really come to the forefront in the last uh, a decade in particular. And I think COVID has really just um, exposed these challenges even more, um, you know, showing that our residents who are already living on the edge and increasingly so over the past decade, uh, we can and it's, we see her much more clearly in this COVID pandemic, just how vulnerable uh, they are. So. Um, I think we're at a really unique opportunity, uh, unique point as an organization for sure. Um, just want to add in that uh, I've lived on the waterfront uh, for the past 13 years from 2007 to 2019. I only just recently moved a few blocks north about a year ago. Um, so uh, that was actually one of my big motivating factors in applying to uh, for the board position uh, was because I've, I've lived it. It's, uh, you know, I've uh, moved down here, uh, you know, single or a couple, no child, and then been raising my daughter on the waterfront. And I've always considered it my backyard and my cottage, uh, you know, with my lived experiences, not having cottages or access to, to those types of, um, uh, you know, um, spaces. So certainly one of the reasons why I chose to live on the waterfront was it is like a backyard and a cottage. So um, going through those 29 attributes, Chris, it was interesting. I mean, personally, I think we're only missing maybe seven or eight. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't improve on the other stuff, but uh, I don't know if, uh, how those attributes were, you know, how those um, grades were arrived at, but just having lived here over the, you know, for 13, down here for 13 years and still use it as my backyard and my cottage, uh, I thought we were a little hard on ourselves. But anyway, that doesn't mean there aren't places to get better. But like I said, I think there's a great opportunity. And I, I was just wondering, and one document that really uh, I always read every year and turn to a lot is the, the annual Toronto Foundation report uh, called Vital Signs. They put that out every year. And like I said, it's, uh, it's factual. It, it's kind of a really a measure of how well we are doing as a city. And when I think about the questions that you've posed in terms of, you know, kind of what's a great waterfront city, um, what I wonder is what is our definition of great i mean i have had the privilege to have visited a lot of those kind of cities on those top 10 lists but i'm wondering if uh you know if um, we've had a chance to really think about what's our definition of a great city and to me that should be driven by who are we building our waterfront for i understand we have to balance you know economic growth and tourism and you know we're building a neighborhood but uh i'd love if we could kind of i guess you know go back and really you know think about that question of who are we building the waterfront for personally I think a great city and great neighborhoods are, are those that are built to accommodate all residents of all incomes all ages all cultures and all mental and physical abilities uh, the neighborhood I used to live in down on the waterfront for 13 years was a Bathurst Key neighborhood and the reason why I lived there was I loved it because it was a true mixed use so when you're looking I guess for examples of kind of these true mixed use communities that's this little pocket in Toronto that's uh, often overlooked but it had Toronto community housing, it had a seniors co-op, it had an artist co-op, had a seniors facility for seniors with physical disabilities. It had obviously, you know, high income, you know, um, you know, condo housing as well, but it was this wonderful neighborhood. So that's something that, you know, would be great, I guess, as we go through this exercise to really think about what's our definition. And the online survey results I thought were uh, quite interesting. I think I actually participated in it <laughs> from the resident perspective. And I thought when you look down, look at the list actually, when I examined it, Eight out of the eight or nine out of the 10 top priorities had to do with enhancing enjoyment or access to the kind of natural beauty and attributes of the waterfront. Only one of them, the waterfront dining, that was interesting, was actually something that is kind of a commercial 
kind of a things to do or place to go uh, for to spend money kind of uh, um, priority. So I thought it was quite interesting and telling, I think, that again, I don't know, you know, who responded and all the breakdown, but I thought that's something I just wanted to kind of share from my analysis was, you know, three out of the 10 were kind of had to do with physical access. Three out of the 10 had to do with kind of uh, enhancing kind of the natural kind of beauty. Uh, three out of the 10 were related to kind of a more design related, intimate scale, vibrant neighborhood. Like I said, only the one had to do with actually creating something. So again, I think it'll be interesting just to think about how aligned are our kind of, you know, signature projects and um, our priorities moving forward with kind of these types of, um, you know, survey results. And also, I guess, our organization's definition of great moving great, forward. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, does any other buddy have any other questions or comments? Um, Steve, it's Wendy. I've just got a few comments to add. Sure. So in terms of cultural destinations, I think that uh, we have an opportunity in Toronto that's pretty unique in, in terms of some innovative solutions. There's not necessarily one big cultural institution that we need to build there or move there, but we do have the opportunity to cluster culture together. And so we don't have in Toronto a dance centre where we could serve, you know, 12 to 20 dance companies in one building, which would be fantastic. In Vancouver, they've got a dance centre. We don't have a theatre centre which can serve so many of our companies as well. And there's also an opportunity to build a visual arts hub because so many of those organisations are being pushed out of the city. So there's some opportunities to, to create clusters where we don't have to um, you know, overburden some of these not-for-profit organizations where they can't really manage to um, pay and build and, and operate a facility. It's not their area of expertise. And I think there's, there's something that we could do that would be really unique and very powerful. So I just wanted to add that. And the other piece I would add is just scale. Um, you know, George, you talked about how critical it is to maybe hold on to some of the land. All of these places around the world that we looked at, and it was a fantastic presentation, so thank you. There's some big scale where we've got some big, big areas of green and public spaces and nature and places to hang out. And you can really see in our city right now how compromised we are. We've got this huge you know, group of uh, our public. There's nowhere for them to go. And it's really been tragic to see through COVID. So, you know, having come from Vancouver and growing up in the West Coast, and you've always got somewhere to go in terms of nature. And in terms of our city, I think we really have to think very seriously about that. And I think, you know, holding on to some of the land and having an opportunity for large green public spaces is absolutely critical as we go forward. So that's, uh, those are just a few thoughts. Great. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, good thoughts. Um, Anybody else have any comments? Going once. Um, Patrick has a comment in the group chat. I don't know if. Oh, OK, I didn't see that. Oh, it was just an effort to save time. So I mean. I think it's, uh, you know, I'd like to see some comparison on some of the elements when it comes to uh, uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, the economic development that's been brought to those locations, the fiscal sustainability, to your point earlier, uh, Steve, on on the cost of building public infrastructure. Um, you know, maybe another element. Uh, look, I'm from Montreal, and you have very large uh, public spaces. What I found unique with Toronto was that the interconnectivity of the green spaces. Um, you know, the, the I think that that's uh, important and um, needs to be uh, you know it needs to be emphasized in terms of how we build out the, the waterfront and making sure that it's uh, integrated into all that's already uh, existing um, and in the interest of time uh, you know maybe maybe the last point sorry is just that on the digital front um, you know we're uh, you know technology and then with so much to what extent can we uh, have a digital experience with uh, with our meandering the waterfront, um, not just close to the water, but uh, you know, the, the area in, in, in general. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Good points again. Anybody else? Okay, so why don't we move on then at this point? Um, 
Uh, we were also then going to next on the agenda is the Portlands planning framework and Villiers Island precinct plan. Okay, uh, so Jed is going to start this. So, uh, Jed, I think you and Chris are doing this one, and Chris, I think you can manage the presentation. Um, I know, How's it got I, enough? I, I think I'm driving. Okay, so I will stand in front of you turn over to Jed. Uh, so uh, my name is Jed Kilborn, and I'm the uh, Director of Development Planning with Waterfront Toronto. Um, and I want to give you a, a kind of a, a broader understanding. So we've looked at the the kind of the the global context of of waterfront development, and and I want to give you a little bit of a sense of of some of the local context that we're working within. Um, and and I'll speak a little bit about that, and then Chris will take over for a little bit more specificity. Um, and I wanted to make my computer work first of all. There we go. Um, so to talk about the Portland's planning framework, and this was a, a plan that was developed uh, in partnership with the city of Toronto, and it guides uh, development in the Portland's uh, over the next 50 years. Um, it's a, it was a, a, about a three and a half year process that was uh, that was adopted by city council uh, at the end uh, at the end of 2017 in December. I think the the only caveat that I have is I have. Um, I'm going to show you about 13 slides. The planning framework itself is uh, close to 600 pages. So imagine this as uh, like an ice cube on the tip of an iceberg. Um, there's a lot of really good information in the planning framework. And the, I think the, the key thing is that it, it kind of helps present a vision for how we could reimagine the portlands. Um, just to familiarize you a little bit, obviously you know where the portland is is um, this is this is looking at the entire study area that's the ship channel right in the middle of the screen um, and um, uh, you you can see uh, where the the naturalized mouth of the Don River is um, and the the kind of blocky thing the gray blocky thing right there is um, uh, the Hearn generating station and I think one of the critical things about the planning framework and one of the things that makes it unusual is it recognizes that we aren't working with a, a completely blank slate. In fact, there are a, a lot of active port uses and industrial uses in the portlands. I mean, that's what it was originally designed for. Um, but this just gives you a sense that the, the planning framework really did uh, really attempted to um, reimagine the port lands, but still maintain a lot of those active uses. So you have there's existing hydro infrastructure, um, Pinewood uh, film studios exist down there already. Um, there are a number of uh, industrial uses. And, um, and obviously, as you look at the port, you can still see ships coming in and out of the, uh, the harbor. And from a policy perspective, if you look at the, the right hand side of your screen, you have the City of Toronto's official plan and then underneath that you have the Central Waterfront Secondary Plan where Waterfront Toronto gets a lot of its um, guidance. Um, and then within that, uh, you have the Portland's planning framework and then on the, on the far left, or far right rather, you have precinct and context planning. And we'll talk a little bit about the two of those, but right now I'll focus on the planning framework. And the planning framework really had 12 objectives. Um, the first was to make sure that um, associated development is diverse and has, has a, a really high standard of design. But I think the other thing uh, that the planning framework recognized very clearly was that as we moved in a post-industrial landscape, we wanted to focus on some of the industries as well and bring in some of the industries that had already started to kind of organically happen. So production-oriented, digitally connected, and innovative uses uh, to, to kind of round out the existing industrial character. It was also a real... Uh, key move to connect uh, the port lands to the rest of the city. Um, right now, it, it, I think in many people's minds, it's really disconnected from the city. Um, and some of the work that we're doing as part of the flood protection work, I think will help stitch the port lands back into the rest of the city. Um, I'm not going to go through the all, all 12 objectives, just to note that this there, there were these kind of high level guiding principles that, that really framed how uh, development in the port land was supposed to to, to look, and a lot of that has to do with uh, maintaining kind of a diversity of uses. So from industrial to recognizing the, the fact that there are some naturalized areas, that there would be some formal park space and, and a whole mix and, and including residential. And this gives you a map of what uh, the, the kind of imagined land uses would be. And you can see that there's still a heavy em emphasis on 
on uh, port and port industrial uses, as well as a focus in the in the maroon in the middle, a focus on production, interactive and creative uses, as well as mixed residential uh, uses and um, and kind of more light industrial and productive uses right at the the kind of northeastern corner of the of the map. And just to the, 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 the terms that you'll probably most hear right now as board members are um, the idea of mixed use residential and um, the, the, the idea of um, the productive productions, interactive and creative uses. So the pick uses. And those are the Toronto's uh, kind of a focus on Toronto's screen based industries. Um, so film, television and digital media. And there's a part of the, the, the Portlands that is um, the planning, the, sorry, the uh, pick core, which is exclusively de devoted to those kinds of uses. And then there's also the pick mixed use, which are neighborhoods adjacent to that pick core area that would still have a lot of those uses, but also incorporates some residential uses. And then at the top le left hand corner of the screen, you'll see the mixed use residential. And that is more like uh, the, the kind of typical development that Waterfront Toronto has, has seen on and overseen on the, on the rest of the waterfront. So the East Bayfront development where there's a mix of residential and commercial uses, um, as well as uh, retail, institutional and recreational uses. And I think one of the things that's worth noting is that the, the planning framework also gives attention to the fact that like our previous uh, uh, precinct, um, for example, East Bayfront um, or the West Onlands, there's a focus on the provision of affordable housing. Um, and in the top right of the screen, you can see the, the, the breakdown of land uses and you can see that the, there's the mixed use residential actually only represents almost 5% of the entire land use in the, in the port with uh, about 36, 37% still devoted to port and port industrial uses. So one of the interesting things about this plan will be that um, it has a kind of really um, industrial and um, um, residential character focused on a lot of the water uses. Um, and the affordable housing specifically is targeted to be at least 15 to 20%, um, with any of the public lands uh, being devoting 20% of the GFA to, um, to of, of the built GFA um, to, to affordable housing. In addition to this, um, you'll see that there are a number of parks and open spaces that are imagined by the uh, by the planning framework. Um, right in the center of the screen, you can see the naturalized mouth of the Don River. So this is the creation of Villiers Island. Um, the on in the top north kind of northwest corner is Promontory Park and uh, River Park South uh, in Villiers Island. But then you can also see that the, uh, the, the naturalized area south of the, the, where the port lands is the Leslie Spit and, and the maintenance of those kind of more open and I guess for lack of a better word, rustic <laughs> park spaces. Um, but there's also the continuation of the uh, Water's Edge Promenade in addition to more formal parks like McCleary Park and a reimagining of what the Hearn might be in the future. With respect to mobility, um, it's worth noting that there, there are major, major road networks being proposed, particularly commissioners, the realignment of Broadview, um, the, the extension of the Dawn Roadway. Um, but then there's also a, a broad transit network, and this picks up from uh, Pina's point uh, in the earlier presentation about the extension of the Queen's Key LRT um, into the Portlands. So there's still imagined to be a, a transit network that supports both Villiers Island and the residential development in the rest of the Portlands. Um, but I think critical to this as well is an acknowledgement in the, in the planning framework of an entire marine network that would support all of these uses as well. Um, and, and that's some of the work that Waterfront Toronto is kind of pushing forward as well. In addition to which, uh, there's, there's a pretty robust cycling network throughout the Portlands, but focused predominantly on the northern half above the, the ship channel. 
sustainability is a critical part of both Waterfront Toronto's um, mandate, but also the, the the planning framework with an idea that this becomes, uh, the, the Portlands becomes a net zero energy district uh, with increased mobility choices, um, ecological integrity, um, a focus on kind of innovation economy um, with an acknowledgement, particularly because of the flood protection work being done, uh, that, that climate change is a very real issue that needs to that needs to be addressed. Um, and you can see that the energy profile in the Portlands is broken up between residential, retail, and office. With the the idea that there, these are the significant um, the, the the places that would be the most energy intensive, where we can then focus our sustainability efforts. And finally, um, the planning framework acknowledges and, and imagines these 11 unique districts. Um, I think the ones that, that we'll focus on for now, uh, Chris is gonna talk about Villiers Island, which is number the number one at the, at the kind of north, northwestern corner of the map. Uh, but the next focus for re mixed use residential will be the McCleary district, which is number four on the map there, um, as well as the, 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 the an urban design guideline that is being undertaken by the city and supported by Waterfront Toronto for what is called the, the right here, it's called the Turning Basin District. It's also called Pick Core. And with that, I will turn it over to Chris, who can talk more in depth about Villiers Island. Okay, thank you, Jed. Um, yeah, so Villiers Island is um, actually kind of an amazing thing because we are building a new island uh, as part of the uh, flood protection project, which uh, David Justerin is busily uh, delivering despite the uh, pandemic. Um, so we're gonna have a new island on our harbor in addition to all the great islands we've already had. Um, next slide, please. I think you have the control, Jed. Ah, there Did we get, go. There you go. And I just wanted to start by mentioning, um, you know, we've been we've been really trying to be innovative and creative uh, with this precinct uh, for quite some time, and um, I think even even in the absence of sidewalk, you know, we uh, we have a lot of innovative ideas that we have tried to bring to bear and and would like to realize. And one of the things sidewalk was attempting to do was to create a climate positive community and that really came from us asking for it because when we first did the plan for naturalizing the river and flood protecting the river our project was recognized internationally for its uh, its innovation and its its boldness and we were uh, made one of the founding cities of the Clinton Climate Initiative which was a program started by Bill Clinton to try to promote climate positive urban development which basically means cities, city areas, city districts that um, not only do not emit any carbon, but actually offset carbon production uh, off-site. So through either exporting uh, clean energy um, or, or other means. And so you see here on the Clinton Climate Initiative map, Toronto Waterfront, uh, what we at that time called the Lower Don Lens Plan, um, which uh, the, the centerpiece of which is Villiers Island. So. Um, we have a history of, of ambition for this site. Next slide, please. It's I think uh, just a second. Jed's computer is just a little slow to get recognized on the on the network. Right. There we go. Uh, so um, we uh, completed um, a precinct plan for this area. Uh, we had uh, urban strategies as our urban planning consultant, um, and we did this um, pretty much hand in glove with the City of Toronto Planning Department. And like our other precinct plans, it it attempted to lay out a whole framework for the new community. So looking at built form controls, looking at land use, looking at affordable housing, looking at community facilities, and looking at parks. Next slide, please, Jed. And this is what the plan looks like. I'm not gonna walk you through the whole thing because it would take too long. But essentially, it is a fairly dense uh, urban neighborhood in the middle of the island, ringed by uh, a great open space system. So what we call Promontory Park on the left, what we call River Park on the south, um, portions of which are being built as part of the flood protection. Um, 
then there's Villiers Park, which is a future park to be built through development charges. And actually where the map has the label Promontory Park, that is actually what we now call Promontory Park North. And that's also meant to be delivered through development charges. Um, and then within the precinct, you can see um, we've tried to control for a whole series of uh, urban elements, like where retail should go, uh, where historic buildings should be preserved, which view corridors we want to save, um, as well as uh, uh, ideas about uh, the relationship of the parks to the neighborhood. Next slide, please. And you see the Keyside site in the upper left there, by the way, in the dashed blue line. So this is right across the Keating Channel from Keyside. And we set out some guiding principles for this, uh, again, in, in cooperation with city uh, city planning department. So the goals were to animate and activate the water's edges, create this spectacular network of open space, and to provide catalytic uses. So going back to our earlier discussion around uh, cultural institutions as a draw and as a way to animate year round, we've got a couple of sites identified in Villiers as placeholders for a possible institution like that. Um, thinking about the island as a gateway to the greater portlands, prioritizing pedestrian cycling and transit as modes of getting around, planning for a mixed use and inclusive community. So again, with targets for affordable housing, uh, as well as some commercial use, providing a variety of built form, um, trying to actually develop a model that showed how we could achieve climate positive, um, and all of this while ensuring that the plan was viable and implementable. Next slide. And some of the key elements that uh, came out of the plan uh, were the idea of an island with varied water's edges. So we have some naturalized edges, we have some hard edges, um, and that leads to the second one, create a central living room. So you know, one of the things we don't really have in Toronto is those kind of great urbanized waterways like the Chicago River, um, you know, or the Riverwalk in San Antonio, if you know it. And the Keating Channel is actually a great opportunity for that. So we see that as the kind of super densified, urban activated area with retail, with restaurants, with pubs. Um, and that um, is no longer the mouth of the river in our future plan. That is basically an overflow point for storms. The rest of the time it's a slip, so it's very calm and becomes that kind of center of, of urban life. And then by shifting the river mouth to the south, um, we created the opportunity for something a little quieter, a little bit more uh, nature focused with the wetlands, the transitions to the sort of urban intensification along Commissioner Street. Um, a connected island, so we have uh, several points of connection that we've proposed, either for cars or pedestrians or bikes at different points across uh, the water. A complete island, so it's not a, a res purely residential enclave. It has a slightly lower uh, balance of commercial than maybe some other precincts, um, partly because of the expectation that um, First Gulf at the time was going to build a massive um, commercial cluster on the Unilever site, which is uh, uh, almost literally a baseball throw away from here. Um, so we didn't know that we were going to compete with them. If those plans change. There might be an opportunity for more commercial here if we get the streetcar line uh, running out. Um, but also thinking of it as a destination. I mean, this will be a pretty special place in Toronto, and we want to make sure that it has the kind of uses that will draw uh, people to come and visit it. So whether that's Promontory Park and the Destination Playground or some new cultural institutions uh, on those two red dots, uh, which are both uh, potential sites. Um, and then an island with history. We've actually gone far out of our way to preserve most of the historic buildings there. Um, there is the one um, that's on the left side of that box that says an island with the history, that kind of orange rectangle that shows a little view corridor out to the water. That was MT35, which the city considered heritage, the 1960s era warehouse. Um, that burned down, so it is no longer on the map. So this is from when we did the precinct plan before that. Um, but these are some of the uh, aspirations for this as a community. Perfect timing, Jed. Um, so the development plan calls for almost 5,000 units of housing, um, which is a good sized neighborhood, which would be about eight to 10,000 residents, um, about 3,000 jobs, and very well served by parkland uh, within this uh, five minute walking radius. Um, and, uh, you know, boating access, recreational boating access, there will be kayak launches that will be within a walk of this neighborhood, um, as well as the whole, uh, um, uh, park system in Promontory Park. Next slide. 
And um, we went through a really interesting exercise to think about how can we make sure that we're not doing anything that would preclude this becoming a, a climate positive neighborhood. So we hired a firm from Vancouver called SSG to review the precinct plan as it evolved. And we learned some interesting things. Um, they came up with a series of parameters and the report is interesting, but they had, they, they had this series of suggestions. Um, one that we uh, attempt to mandate, which we could do through our development agreements, um, designing to passive house standards, um, which is what um, Sidewalk was proposing to do on Keyside. There's costs to that, so we obviously have to find the right balance. Um, but if we were able to do that, um, that would take us pretty far. Uh, they also recommended optimizing the urban form for energy harvesting, and this was a very interesting exercise that I'll explain in a minute. Uh, maximizing solar uh, photovoltaic, and this uh, site is well um, sort of situated and oriented to, uh, to capitalize on that. And then to meet the remaining energy demand with district energy, which is something Waterfront Toronto proposed a long time ago, um, and um, is, uh, is uh, you know, something that we might revisit through uh, NWAVE. So next slide, please. And using electric cars was another uh, idea. So just to finish off, so the solar modeling, we looked at where do you put the tower buildings relative to the base buildings? And um, what we found is that by shifting them to the north, we can actually save uh, the equivalent of 400 units worth of heating energy in the, in the winter time by not having the towers casting shadow on the windows of the units behind them. So, um, so this is really a kind of uh, climate positive ready neighborhood. Uh, when we are uh, in a position to develop it. Next slide, please. I'm going to wrap up now because I know we are coming up on the end of our time. Um, a lot of this is already material I spoke to. Here's the park system and the heritage. Next slide, please. Uh, the anticipation is to extend the streetcar line out here um, and also to extend the pedestrian cycling and trail network, some of which is being built as part of the flood protection project. Next slide, please. Okay, this is going to be the test. Give me a second, folks. Oh, and I guess that's it. And now it's just a video. So yeah. I'm done. This is the fly through um, of the Villiers Island and River neighborhood, and Jed is going to attempt to make this play. <laughs> okay, hang on just a second, please. It's not projecting Jed at the moment. No, I know. Um, hang on just a sec. I'm just trying to make this happen. There we go. Oh, we're having technical problems, but, but that's fine. Okay, is that still not working? Sorry, sorry, we're just having technical problems. So I think, uh, Chris, <laughs> I think we're done at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So Steve, I turn that, it back folks. to you. Okay. Um, I, I assume I'm off mute. 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 Uh, so thank you. Uh, Chris for that and um, any um, does anyone have any comments or questions? Okay, so then um, I think that um, takes care of the public portion of the agenda. So I'm going to ask for a motion to go into the closed session. I'll move it, Steve. It's Jack. Okay, thank you. Jack.